And I wish I could make it to Indonesia, but maybe next uh, years we can make it uh, in person. So we are located in Switzerland. This is our university in the uh, heart of the beautiful city of uh, Zurich. And we are part of Safari Research Group led by Professor Honor Mutlu. We are a bit large research group with a lot of researchers. And our motto is to think big and aim high. So as you all know about the current pandemic, the COVID-19 has killed nearly 2.2% of the infected population and the pandemic is still uh, continues. And we need basically to effectively curbing the disease spread. And we don't have any efficient medication uh, to uh, cure the COVID-19. I heard about a recent uh, medication that is approved recently in the US, I think, but to still not publicly available to everyone. We have some uh, efficient vaccine, I would say, but uh, again, they are not widely available to everyone. So the only way we have currently to curb the spread of COVID-19 is to early detect these cases and try to isolate them. Plus some strict mitigation measures that can, for example, uh, impose social distancing and such. So the other way, the other very efficient way to surveillance of the pandemic or to control the pandemic basically is to do three main directions. The first one is to analyze genomes and we really need to analyze a large number of these genomes. The second direction is to do metagenomic profiling, where we detect the viruses, the bacteria, and see how they are correlating with the COVID-19 and such. The third direction is to predict the disease spread, such as the health system will be well prepared for a large number of cases, for example. And at Safari Sushi Group, we develop some work in each of these three directions. And I'm going through these three directions one by one. So the first direction is to analyze genome, and we want to make this happening at population scale. As I mentioned, we need really to analyze large number of genomes for the entire population, for example. All right, so how to analyze a genome? So assume you have a genetic sample. Uh, you can get it from blood, for example, and we would like to get the full sequence of your DNA, which is something like this. However, unfortunately, we don't have any machine that can provide you the complete sequence of your DNA. What we have machines that called sequencing machines, these take a sample that is processed in the lab. So it's not the, the raw blood sample, but rather after the blood sample, you do some processing in the wet lab, you provide it to the sequencing machine, and this sequencing machine give you really small randomized fragments of your DNA. So again, it's not the complete sequence, but rather pieces of your DNA that are generated randomly from all location in your reference genome you know, or from your DNA sequence. We call each of these pieces as a read, and that's why we need a step following uh, the sequencing called read mapping. Read mapping, as the name imposed, is a step, a computational step that try to link these pieces together. So you try to map these reads, link them together to build back your DNA sequence. So you could start with one of these uh, commercial kit from the pharmacy or the store where you can get it, swap, take a swap from your body and send back the sample to the company to do the analysis for you. The company will use one of these machines. We call them sequencing machine. These really vary in size, can be as a fridge size or handheld devices. However, all of them, they have one common characteristics that they produce reads, not the complete sequence of the DNA. And these reads still lack information about their order and the location. So we don't know which part of the genome or which chromosomes they are generated from. So as I mentioned, we need to link these reads together to build back the DNA sequence. So I like this analogy about solving the puzzle, which is similar to read mapping or genome analysis. So imagine you have the reference picture and you have a lot of pieces for the puzzle to solve. And good luck mapping each of these pieces to the reference picture, and then you build the entire puzzle. And this is exactly what we are doing in read mapping. 
So first, we got the reference picture, which is the reference genome in our case. And this is publicly available. You can access it from this link. And fortunately, we got this reference genome in 2003 after 13 years of uh, researching and uh, trying to build this reference genome. However, it wasn't uh, full, fully uh, complete in that time. And only this year, we could close many gaps in the reference genome and we build the complete reference genome. The read sets or the pieces coming from the sequencing machine are also publicly available. And there is a huge amount of sequencing data that you can access online. This is one example. If you change the accession number, which is at the end of the link, you can get many of these uh, data as well. You can see information about the sequencing machine was used and many more. All right, so now you got the reference genome, which is FASTA file, and you got the read set, which is FASTAQ file. The read set, four lines per piece. So every read you get from the sequencing machine will have, will have a four lines. The second line out of these four lines is the sequencing or is the sequencing read or the, the, the read content itself. So you can see ACGT over there. So now how we do read mapping. First, since the, this, the reference genome is really huge, for example, for human can be 3.2 gigabyte, for uh, fruits or plants, it's way uh, larger than that. So we cannot easily access that full reference genome and query it. For that, we need an index uh, data structure. For example, hash table. So you need to extract pieces out of the reference genome. Uh, there are different ways how you extract these. And each of these pieces can be from uh, 12 bases long all the way to 20, for example, or 22 it can be for, uh, for example, 60 long, depends on the application you are targeting. So you store these pieces in the hash table or any kind of indexing data structure. And then you have the FASTQ file, which is the read. You do exactly the same. You extract pieces exact same way you extracted from the reference genome. And you use these pieces not to store them in the hash table, but rather to query the hash table that you already created. So you take the blue piece, you query the hash table, you find two matches here and there, you query the green, you find here and there, you query the red, you find it over here and over there. Now, since the blue piece in the read was followed by a green one, and the green one was followed by a red one. So it makes sense to do the comparison over this line because we have exact same order appeared in the uh, reference genome. So we pick that subsequence from the reference genome and we start to do what we call a dynamic programming, a sequence alignment uh, algorithm, where we uh, try to find the exact location of every match and every mismatch. So these location are really important to infer a disease or the cause, the genetic cause of a phenotype, for example. So when we talk about disease, not necessarily to be harmful, it could be just phenotype like hair color, eye color, and so on. And it's really important to know the, the type of these genetic variations. It could be insertion, deletion, substitutions, and so on. So that's why we are using computationally expensive algorithm to find these differences because the interpretation of these differences is really important for clinical practice. Now, this is in summary, read mapping. So you have the genetic sample, you send it to the sequencing machine, you extract reads, and then you have the reference genome, you pick one read, you do the process that I just described in the previous slide, and then you do the same process for every single read you have it in your sample. And then you build back your DNA sequence. All right, I hope this is clear for now. So when we do the analysis for the entire pipeline, starting from sequencing all the way to the interpretation, we find that the sequencing doing really very well. So you can sequence a single human genome at 30X coverage in about one hour. And 30X coverage means that you are reading the same location 30 times, just to be sure and uh, increase your confidence because these machines normally have some errors. And uh, to cover these errors, you need to read it many times. However, when it comes to the computational analysis, we find that the entire pipeline is bottlenecked in read mapping. Of course, this is not considering base calling, assuming base calling is done in parallel with the sequencing. So there is a huge gap between the sequencing and read mapping. 
All right, so what makes this a huge gap or what makes read mapping a bottleneck? So the first cause is that we are generating really huge amount of sequencing data because the, the cost of the sequencing is going really down and the throughput of, or uh, the, the ability of this sequencing machine to process many sample in parallel is really huge. So we are now generating a way larger data than before. Unfortunately, we are using a sophisticated, a customized machine for sequencing, but we are still using general purpose machine for the analysis. So the, the, these computer, general purpose computer used for the analysis are not specialized to the operation of read mapping or genome analysis. And we are still following the Van Neumann model from 1945, where the CPU need to uh, access an off chip memory to get the data and then start processing. And this is what we call uh, 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 a compute. Uh, and this is what uh, we have the separation between the storage, the main memory and the, the CPU. And we have between them really power hungry buses to deliver the data and in both direction for the storage and for reading. And for that data analysis is really performed far away from the data. Okay, what kind of problem when we have the processing done really far from the data? So this is the full pipeline where we have the sequencing machine, it transfer the data to the storage unit and then storage unit transfer the data to the main memory, then to several level of caches all the way to the CPU cores. And this huge amount of data movement really is a bottleneck. Why is that? Because single memory access can consume at least 160x more energy compared to performing a complex addition operation at the CPU side. So imagine just by doing memory access, just to get a piece of data from the main memory, you are consuming a lot of energy compared to performing computation inside the CPU. And this is what we call data movement, really dominates the performance, and it's currently a major system energy bottleneck, accounting for at least 40% of the overall uh, system energy. So it's really uh, a problem here to move a huge amount of data over all these pieces in the compute stack. So we'd like to really find an efficient solution for genome analysis. When we check the execution time for read mapping, hoping to analyze the, the bottleneck and try to figure out what, what, what are the problems, we find that more than 60% of the total execution time is just spending in comparing these genomic uh, sequences. So after you figure out the location from the hash table, then you start to do the comparison to figure out where are the exact locations or the exact matches and mismatches. Uh, that is really time consuming because we are using dynamic programming algorithm, which normally run in quadratic time complexity. Also, when we do the comparison, because we are using small pieces from the read and from the reference to define this location, the reference genome. So we find that 98% of the time that we are comparing the two sequences together using dynamic programming algorithm, we find these two sequences to be highly dissimilar. So they don't have really genetic meaning such that they have a lot of differences everywhere. That is not a good candidate to be looked at and we need to find something else, another location where we have few mismatches or few differences. All right, so hoping by that I cover um, most of the problems we have in genome analysis or the current pipeline for genome analysis. And when we look at the compute stack, all the way starting from the data itself to the problem, to the algorithm, to the operating system, all the way to the electrons or transistors, there are always plenty of room for improvement in the bottom of the stack at the, uh, at the transistor level, where Moore's law, for example, predicted to increase or double the number of transistor. So we can always have higher performance within the same uh, silicon die or the same area of silicon. We can increase the number of transistor to improve the performance. And we also have plenty of room for improvement at the top of the stack, meaning that the data itself, we can improve it using compression, for example, or some kind of heuristic to reduce the amount of data. We can also improve the uh, runtime complexity of the algorithms and so on. 
So when we look at this simple example where we do um, uh, matrix multiplication, so you, you need uh, three nested for loop, and this is how we do the multiplication. And trying to optimize that, when you use software optimization from Python all the way to C, for example, you can see some benefits. For example, 47x of speed up. But when you move to the hardware acceleration, where you have SIMD a unit to do the parallel operation, you can see great benefits of uh, speeding up this uh, simple operation. So it's really, uh, it's not only about the software optimization, not only about the hardware optimization, but it's really about both. And for that, we really need intelligent algorithms that are aware about the hardware, and we need intelligent architecture that are also aware about the improved algorithm, such that we can handle data very well. All right, so in this paper, in our recent paper, we figure out all the way to accelerate a different step of read mapping to improve the full uh, genome analysis pipeline. And we find out a lot of great work being done in this area and a lot of different algorithms, including our own work from uh, the, our research group on how to accelerate all these steps. We find the disadvantages, the advantages of many of these uh, steps as well. So I recommend everyone to read this paper. All right, so our contribution to accelerate genome analysis, which is the first direction in controlling the pandemic, is first to replace the CPU by a specialized accelerators, including GPU and FPGAs. And we have done a lot of work in this direction. And also we try to replace the memory or to empower the memory to do the processing inside the memory device. So you don't really need to move the data from the memory device all the way to the CPU through different level of caches and through power hungry buses to do the processing. And we have done several work in this area, which are empowering the memory to do uh, pre-alignment filtering, for example, where you can quickly detect the number of differences between two genomic sequences and remove them before you use uh, computationally expensive dynamic programming algorithms. We also done the dynamic programming algorithm inside the memory uh, with our recent work, we call it Genasm. And with that, we are covering uh, the two uh, important components of the compute stack for starting from the, the memory all the way to the CPU. However, we still need to do this more processing at the storage unit or inside the sequencing machine to minimize data movement between these different components. So our first work called Sneaky Snake, which is the first design for CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs. And with that, we make a key observation that correct alignment or the correct comparison between two genomic sequences, you can see them at the X axis and the Y axis, are really a sequence of non-overlapping long matches. So this is the what we call a dot plot, or you can consider it as dynamic programming table, where you compare every base in the X axis with the uh, every base in the Y axis. And whenever it, it matches, so you can highlight it in a red, Whenever it's a flip, you can uh, highlight it in a blue. So you can see the correct alignment, which is exactly around the diagonal, uh, if you consider it uh, rotated, or the anti-diagonal, if you like so. So this is, uh, this is really the correct alignment where you can figure out most of the exact matches between the two sequences. And when you look deeper inside it, you will find it as a sequence of non-overlapping long matches uh, progresses over the entire uh, main diagonal of this table. So with that, we have an, a key idea that approximate, approximating at a distance calculation is really similar to a very famous problem in VLSI chip design, which we call it single net routing problem. For those who doesn't know VLSI chip, this is the, the black piece you can see in most, almost all electronics. And when you dissect through this uh, piece or this chip, you'll see a lot of components inside the chip that are connected to each other. And our problem is to pass from the left side all the way to the right side through a shortest path. 
and passing through the minimum number of components because it's very expensive to pass through each component in the chip. You could avoid the, 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 these pieces inside the chip, but you want also to maintain shortest path. So basically you want to always keep moving in a straight lines. Whenever you hit any component inside the system on chip or the, this chip, you basically want to detour to different path. And then you keep moving in straight lines. Why we move in straight lines? Because straight lines always lead to the shortest path. And with that, we got really significant results out of Sneak Snake to improve genome analysis. So we find that Sneak Snake is up to four order of magnitude more accurate than existing state of the art filters. And when we verify our design using short reads, which are uh, reads coming from the sequencing machine of up to length 300, we find that we can improve still order of magnitude using CPUs and two order of magnitude using specialized accelerators such as FPGA and GPUs. When we use long reads, we still get significant speed up even compared to real state of the art um, uh, tools for long reads such as KSW2 that is used in Minimap2. All right, so that was for CPUs, GPUs and FPGA. We also move further and we try to do the processing inside the memory with this recent work. So we target a sneaky snake again because it's one of the best or uh, the best basically so far to do the pre-alignment filtering. And the problem is that read mapping is still heavily bottlenecked by data movement from the main memory. This, our solution is to perform read mapping near where data resides. So we don't, know, we don't need basically to move the data from the main memory all the way to the processor. So we carefully redesigned the accelerator logic of Sneaky Snake to do the processing near the memory or near the data. And that uh, we do a proof of concept using uh, Xilinx Vertex uh, Ultra Scale Plus, which has HBMEM cube that is integrated with the FPGA board on the same package substrate. So you have really a high bandwidth uh, memory uh, moved closely to the FPGA logic where you can do processing. And the benefits we got is really significant, such that you can see improvement in terms of performance, energy efficiency by order of magnitude and two order of magnitude respectively over 16 core with 64 hardware threads, IBM Power 9 CPUs. All right, so with that, we cover our recent work um, on uh, pre-alignment filtering. And now I'm covering Genasm, which is our recent work on dynamic programming. It's not filtering, but rather the, the last step of read mapping where you identify the exact location of the matches and mismatches, and you also identify their type, whether they are deletion, insertion, and substitution. So our goal in this work is to accelerate approximate string matching by designing a fast and flexible framework. So we don't want to have only the dynamic programming for sequence alignment, but rather to use the same design for several steps inside the genome analysis, which can accelerate multiple steps of genome sequence analysis that I'm going to show in the next slide as use cases. And we have three main key ideas. The first one is to exploit the high memory bandwidth uh, and the logic layer of 3D stacked memory. And when I say 3D stacked memory, it's a cube. The first layer is logic layer. You can think about it as FPGA. And then on top of it, vertically, it's stacked as multiple DRAM layers. So you can access all these layers with high memory links, with high bandwidth links. And then you move the data from all these DRAM banks all the way to the logic layer to do the processing. And we would like to perform high, highly parallel approximate string matching in the DRAM chip itself. The second key idea is to modify and extend an old algorithm called BITAB. This algorithm was really proposed in 1992. So you can think about an algorithm that was proposed 30 years back, and maybe the author didn't think that might be useful for this case, but you can see the beauty of using really old algorithm, then you enrich it with more features and you enable more application for the same algorithm. This old algorithm wasn't able to support long reads longer than 300, can go all the way to 2 million long sequences. 
and cannot support traceback and also is not highly parallelizable. So we fix all these issues and then we uh, design a sophisticated architecture for that to fit with the recent or emerging uh, memories technologies such as 3D stacked memories. We co-design our modified scalable and memory efficient algorithm that I mentioned about BITAP. And we have the architecture, which is low power and area efficient accelerator. And the results were significant. And we tried them for three different use cases that are fundamental in genome analysis. The first one is read alignment. And we got a huge speed up compared to Minimap2, which is a CPU, uh, CPU version of read mapping, which is very efficient. And it's already using SIMD accelerated or SIMD acceleration to do the very fast processes. And also it's uh, 3.9 at least faster than Darwin, which is state-of-the-art ASIC design. And we have a similar, almost similar speed up with pre-alignment filtering and the huge speed up in edit distance calculation. In edit distance calculation, we don't do, uh, we, we are not interested in different alignment score and such. So the process here is really quick so that you, we only identify the number of matches, but we don't care about the type of matches and so on. All right, so I only presented our two recent uh, work. So there are a lot of work from our research group in this area. I will give you references toward the end of the talk, but now let's talk about the adoption of all these hardware accelerated uh, designs for genome analysis. So is the uh, clinical practice still using these designs or not? When we, uh, when we started our first design back in 2015, we submitted to a journal and we got the review in December, 2016. And one of the reviewer mentioned that uh, a major concern, but it's not a major concern with the paper itself, but rather about the overview of all these hardware designs. So he said, or she, there has been little to no adoption of previous specialized hardware solutions related to improving the speed of alignment. So he's saying like, nobody is using these hardware designs, why we should care? And I attach our response in that time. So we said, it always takes time to adopt a new or different hardware technology. We don't expect the community to adapt our, um, our uh, hardware design quickly because since it requires investment into the hardware infrastructure. And we provide the long response to this point because it's very important to us. So I attach it here, but I'm not going uh, through it. The slides will be publicly available so you can read the full response. And we were true. So it will take time to realize these hardware or the importance of these hardware accelerations. And we need basically to be dreamers. So dream and everything will come true if you are doing the right research as the computing landscape is really different from 10 to 20 years ago. So two years later, one of the main companies in this field that doing sequencing start to use FPGAs inside their machine to do uh, hardware accelerated read mapping. And two years again later, another company called NVIDIA, which is the leader in a GPU uh, board design, so they start using GPUs uh, or producing GPUs for read mapping to accelerate the process. So it's okay to be the first to use a new architecture or new hardware to enable uh, the application to be really fast, especially when we are talking about important applications such as genome analysis. You need to be basically a dreamer about that. However, all these GPUs, FPGA are still bottlenecked by data movement. So uh, we are not talking about processing in memory, we are talking about normal FPGA computation and GPU computation, where you still need to move the data from the main memory all the way to this board through, for example, PCI Express. Okay, so we don't know exactly where to um, place the sequencing machine in, different, in, in all these different components of the system. For example, should we do the processing inside the main memory or inside specialized accelerators or inside the storage or even enable some processing or kind of filtering to reduce the amount of data that is produced by the sequencing machine inside the sequencing machine itself. 
So that is still open question for research. And that is how and where to enable FAST, and not only FAST, especially we are talking about genome analysis. We don't want to tell the patient that you have genetic variation at this location, but in, in reality, it's not. So we want it basically to be accurate and cheap so that we can afford population scale. We want it also to be privacy preserving because we are talking about genomic material that are uh, really holding more information about ourselves, more than just the disease. You can infer the disease of your brother, of your sister, and so on, because all these genomic material are correlated together. So from one genome, you can infer the, the rest of the, the family member genomes. And we want to do it uh, in exabyte scale, because when we're talking about pandemic, we want to do the genomic analysis for the entire population. And that is a huge problem because we are talking about scalability and not only how fast you can achieve single genome analysis, but rather how many genomes you can analyze in one day. Okay, that was for the first direction, analyzing our genomes. And for the second direction, metagenomic profiling. So think about uh, crowd where you would like to do analysis, genomic analysis uh, at some place. So when you take a sample from such places, you don't expect to have a single species in, in such sample, but rather you will have a lot of viruses, bacteria, human, uh, traces of fruits, uh, vegetables, and so on. So you cannot do genome analysis in the regular way I explained in the previous slides, because simply you cannot compare to a single reference genome. You need really a database of reference genome, a large number of reference genome, and you start comparing with one of, with every of these reference genome, hoping to get some hits and you can identify what are the species there. So in metagenomic profiling, our goal is what organisms or species present in a given environmental sample and how abundant are they? So in 2015, there was an important study, try to analyze 1,500 samples from New York subway stations and try to do this only within New York. However, five years later, there's a new study that tried to target a global scale where they uh, detect these samples in 60 cities, not single city, but rather than 60 cities with about 5,000 uh, samples. So you can see that the trend currently is to um, process and analyze a larger number of uh, uh, metagenomic samples. So in our uh, recent paper, we tried to implement or design a very efficient algorithm to try to do metagenomic profiling in an efficient way. And that is the second direction I was mentioning. So this is um, a very quick overview of the algorithm. So I was telling you that we need database of large number of reference genomes. And then we do the comparison with the read set with each of these references in the reference genome database. However, this database can really be huge, such that can uh, be in size three terabyte or four terabyte. If you do the comparison with the read set, which is again, the read set is really huge, especially if you are talking about 30x coverage or 100x coverage, then it will take months to, to perform this process to compare the read set with every single reference in the reference database. And what we did is that we find a nice way called containment minhash, or in short, CMASH, where you extract some long k-mers. It's not as in short as in read mapping, but really long. And then you try to match the k-mers from the read set with the k-mers of each of these reference genome. Whenever you get enough number of k-mer matches, then you consider this a good candidate. And then you add it to the subset database over there. And only this subset database will go to further processes such as read mapping or alignment where you, you find the exact number of differences or the type of these differences such that you can have a high confidence whether this is a virus, bacteria, and so on. And then you build a profile. We did a lot of processes as well about uh, the read, when the read map to different reference genome, for example, and the, all the details in the paper. So you build this profile, you can say that E. coli, for example, exists with 30% of abundance. And the, 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 uh, the performance of the tool is really uh, much faster than existing tools. 
for example, you can achieve 100x of speed up and reduce the false positive, the number of species that you say they exist in your sample, but they do actually do not. So that is what we call false positive. We provide a huge number of reduction uh, in terms of false positives. And the key observation we made in metal line that existing KMERS, um, KMER counting approaches provide inaccurate taxonomic profiles, and uh, which is basically a large number of false positive. And the alignment based, which is the approach that we follow in our work, are often considered accurate, yet computationally infeasible if you want to do it for every reference genome in the database. And what we did in metal line. As I mentioned, filter out reference genome that do not share enough number of regions, and then perform sequence alignment using subset database. And that is uh, providing significant speed up, even compared to the uh, recent or state of the art work called Kraken 2. Sorry, Doctor. Uh, the time for Sorry. presentation is already over. Maybe you have uh, one or two minutes to complete yeah. the presentation. Yeah, I thought it's 45 minutes. So uh, I have, I think, five minutes I will be done. Uh, so if that is fine. So I'll go quickly over just a few slides in the next. And uh, we show that meta line accuracy is really faster than all uh, existing tools. More details in the paper, basically. So I invite everyone to check uh, this work as well. And this is another work. And that's all for metagenomic profiling direction. Now the last direction is to predict the disease spread. So we have a recent work called COVID Hunter, where we try to accurately and flexibly uh, predict the, the, the outbreak, basically. And I have to mention this, that essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. And we are trying to implement a useful model uh, that can be beneficial. So the problem is that no model is capable of accurately simulating the epidemiological situation while accounting for the effects of the environmental conditions. And, considerable, and considering a reasonably low number of assumptions and model parameters. Our goal is to develop such a COVID-19 outbreak simulation model. And existing models basically provide no future prediction and uh, provide also an inaccurate prediction. And I have a lot of results showing these two points. So COVID Hunter has two key ideas. The first one to quantify the spread of COVID-19 in geographical region by calculating the daily reproduction number based on four metrics and also using historical data about hospitalization to cases and death to cases ratios for calculating the accurate number of hospitalization and death. And we show uh, a lot of results about this in the paper and in this slide. So, uh, how does COVID Hunter work? Uh, so basically we need to predict the daily uh, reproduction value, which, um, which is an estimate of how the virus can uh, infect more people based on single case. And we use mitigation measures, information about the environmental conditions and so on to predict that R value. And we label each individual in the population based on different stages of COVID-19. Then we predict the daily number of cases. And based on that, we predict the daily number of hospitalization and death. And basically, we increase the production number when there is a good environmental condition for the increase, such as cold weather, for example, or when we have relaxed and the mitigation measures. We also reduce that when there are specific environmental conditions or we have stricter mitigation measures. And our model allows for uh, directly leveraging existing models. So if you already develop a model uh, that's studying the correlation between environmental conditions and the reproduction number, we can reuse that model directly. So these are the different stages of COVID-19 that are supported by our model, including um, vaccinated, vaccination and immune due to the disease and so on. All right, so we consider Switzerland as a use case for all experiment, but it's still fully configurable for other countries. We use uh, real data from other models and from the uh, Switzerland uh, sources. And we do the comparison with the, the models that are used for decision making in countries such as UK, US, Switzerland, and many more. And we did a lot of accurate predictions and uh, estimation even based on the situation in Switzerland back in July, 
Back in July, we uh, suggested that in August, we should take stricter measures because we start to see rise in the cases after the Delta variant appearing in uh, Switzerland. And that was the case even currently. So the Swiss government, the government already took a stricter measure back in that time. And then we start to see a drop in the cases because of that. And we predicted if the government did not act uh, before October, then the situation will be much worse than what we have now. We have a lot of uh, comparison with other existing models that are important, which are currently used by US, UK government, and even uh, Swiss government. So all the source code, the visualization, the data, everything is publicly available. More details, I recommend everyone to watch this talk about the COVID hunter. Again, the slides will be public available on YouTube and in our link in our website. So I recommend everyone to follow these uh, uh, lectures. So that's all for the three direction of controlling the pandemic. I would like to conclude with this important uh, say from Yale Pat, who is a professor in the University of Texas, Austin, who said the role of architect, computer architect, to look up the nature of the problem, to look down at the computer stack to predict the future of technology, to look backward and to look forward, to listen to the dreamers and examine old code as we did in Genasm, for example, and to listen to the dreamer as we did in Gatekeeper. We were the first to build hardware architecture for pre-alignment filtering. And then a few years later, the industry start to adopt these solutions. So the key takeaways from this talk that population scale analyses are not an easy task, need to consider many things in designing a new system, have a good intuition, insight into the ideas and the trade-off, but it's really fun and can be very rewarding and impactful as it enables a great future. As you can see, genome analysis has really large scientific impact on all aspects of life. And it's a very hot topic for graduate studies and research. I recommend everyone to look into these topics for bioinformatics and do genome analysis, acceleration using hardware, for example, or even algorithm development. So the key conclusion that most speed up comes from parallelism enabled by novel architecture and algorithm, not one of them, but both of them. And we still have this open question that I mentioned before. And then I would like to acknowledge all my colleagues, my professors, and the funding agencies for their generosity. And everything we publish, normally it's publicly available, open source to everyone. So we are hiring really top students. So if you are among the 2% top student, please apply. You can contact me directly or apply directly through this link. These are a large number of references that you can follow, a lot of lectures, videos online and papers. I recommend everyone to go through them. Thank you so much. Sorry if I take more time. Thanks so much, Dr. Isa, and I can take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Anser. Very uh, interesting and very complete uh, presentation. Yeah. Now I will open for the Q&A session. Is there any question from the audience? Maybe only one question. I'm sorry for the limited time. the question. If not, maybe I will give you a question, doctor. Uh, I'm, I'm interested ah, with... Mr. Esa. Uh, yeah? Omni. Oh, okay, okay, Fony. Uh, Mr. Fony, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, uh, just open your uh, okay. mic, yeah. Okay, please. Okay, the Dr. Elser. Mm -hmm. Dr. Elser, yeah. Nice to know you. Thank you so much. Okay, I want to. Uh, I heard that from your presentation. Yeah, my oh, sorry. My name is Fonia Gustiawan from uh, uh, National Research and Innovation Agency. Mm -hmm. I heard from your uh, presentation yeah, that uh, there are bottlenecks yeah, in carrying out a genome sequence analysis. Uh, according to what you know uh, so far. What techniques yeah, or methods, yeah, methods in uh, parallel computing can be attempted uh, to overcome the bottleneck as optimally as possible? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think there is a huge space for improvement 
especially when we talk about parallel processing. So you can consider any of these steps involved in read mapping or base calling, or even any other steps such as uh, sampling, for example, or variant calling inside the genome analysis pipeline, and you'd like to accelerate them. You can also consider other application in genomics, such as metagenomic uh, profiling. Uh, everything I presented today is really a hot topic for parallel processing. So you can uh, try accelerating any of these algorithms, such as you can achieve a high speed up to the uh, overall pipeline. But remember, based on Amdal law, if you accelerate only one sub-step of the full pipeline, then your speed up might not be uh, really high when you consider the full pipeline. So you may accelerate the read mapping by 100x, but when we consider the full genome analysis pipeline, then the speed up might be 5x. This is well known by Amdal Law. Uh, but uh, as I said, there is, uh, I would say, little work on this direction with hardware acceleration. So I invite everyone uh, to push and invest in all direction to accelerate uh, genome analysis. And yet, as you can see, there are a large number these days uh, of funding from NIH, from a, a lot of funding agencies, even in Europe here, uh, with uh, pushing towards hardware acceleration of uh, genome analysis applications. And that is including algorithm development, again, uh, some software optimization, some hardware optimization, and so on. So we have a lot of presentation and talks about these topics and what exactly pieces of software need to be accelerated. So you can follow our uh, research papers that I mentioned in this talk uh, to get more insights about these. But I'm also happy to talk about them offline. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Anastas. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe uh, because we have a limited time. I have to uh, end this session. Yeah. Maybe if you uh, have any question or any topic that needs to be discussed, I think uh, Dr. Alser is already open yeah, for the uh, for the other discussion yeah, by using email or uh, another social media. I think. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. You can use my Twitter account. Oh, over my here. Twitter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I use it uh, more often than uh, my email as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Isa. Yeah, it's been yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Isa. But before we uh, close this session, I have uh, to do uh, two things. Yeah. The first, uh, we have to take a photo group. Yeah. <laughs> so please open your camera so the, uh, the officer can uh, take all the, the photo of us. Yeah. Give a great smile. <laughs> okay. There are two, eh, there are only one, eh, two, two pages. Yeah. Okay. Let's open the camera and you can see all of you. Okay, maybe you can start to take the picture. Uh, Jam, uh, could you help me here to take the picture? Okay. Okay, thanks. For the first page, only two page here. Yeah. And then the second page. Okay. Yeah. Is it come a bit? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you for all. Okay. And then another things the IC3 INA committee uh, will give uh, a certificate yeah, to Dr. Muhammad Alter. Uh, we very uh, thanks for this uh, uh, your talk. Yeah. I, I think it uh, can give a lot of benefits there yeah, for us. Yeah. Uh, this, thank you so uh, much for the organizing community as well. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Alser. So uh, once again, yeah, thank you for the uh, for the speaker and the audience. Yeah, and see you in the other session. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Salam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you.